Well, welcome back to our class called Living Without Shame. And we are now into week five and we're in the section, can we really live without shame? And of course the answer is yes. And we're looking at biblical ways that we can make sure that we are um, not filled with shame. Uh, we looked at the ways in which shame increases in a person's life. And really ultimately the way to live without shame is to live in Jesus Christ. Uh, having faith in him, trusting in him, which we looked at last week. A part of that trusting is waiting upon the Lord. And the Old Testament is rich with these ideas of waiting. But not only the Old Testament, we'll be looking at a couple of New Testament passages as well. Next week, as you can see, we'll be looking at the idea of hoping in God, hoping in the Lord, um, or hoping on in the Lord. And um, another great aspect of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Our main text for today is Psalm 25, verses 1 to 22, and that is the entire psalm. We'll be looking at another psalm and some other passages as we go through today's lesson. So Psalm 25, starting in verse 1, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. And so let's pause here just for a second. In verse 2, we see that the phrase, let me not be put to shame, is really paralleled with let not my enemies exalt over me. And so we go back kind of to week one when we were looking at how does the Bible view shame? What are the components of that? How does that work exactly? And one of the ways one is shamed is if one's enemies have victory over them. If someone is defeated even in battle, a very physical thing, then that's a shameful thing um, in biblical language, in the Old Testament particularly. And so the psalmist here is saying, I trust in you, O oh my God. I lift up my soul to you, O oh Lord. And then the prayer, let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. And then there's the statement of truth. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. In contrast, they shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous, treacherous without abandon, with with abandon, just uh, just treacherous through and through, uh, without any self control. We might say those are the people who will be ashamed. If someone is waiting upon the Lord, they are not put to shame. None who wait for you, O Lord, shall be put to shame. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. So what is this waiting? It's kind of like being silent before the Lord. It is the idea of being patient, the idea of allowing God to be in control, allowing God to do things in his time. We tend to be impatient. We tend to want things now. And there was a level of that. We think of that as a very cultural United States in the 2000s kind of concept of wanting things here and now. And we do. Uh, it's interesting, our campus minister will mention more than once, you know, we want things so fast that, that the the fast food places have had to put two drive throughs in instead of just one. I mean, we we really are a culture that wants things to move very, very quickly. Well, people grew impatient with God Almighty back even thousands of years ago. The ones wandering in the wilderness, they were not very patient. They were very full of grumbling and complaining. Here, we have the confession 
You are the God of my salvation. You are the one that I wait for all the day long. And, and how does this happen? We focus on the Lord's ways. We allow him to teach us his paths. We embrace his truth and his teaching. All these concepts are sewn together into this idea of having great faith and waiting upon the Lord. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. We sing a song sometimes based on these first several verses of this psalm, and I'd like to share those with you at this point. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Remember not the sins of my youth. Remember not the sins of my youth. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Our greatest enemy now is Satan, and I guess always was, even for the people of old. We do not have physical enemies tracking us down for the most part. You may be in a situation where you have an enemy that is uh, pretty aggressively trying to destroy you or your life, but mainly we're looking at spiritual destruction. And so we need to look at those things and those people who are going to hurt our faith, hurt our spirituality, hurt our Christian relationships. And we do not want those to triumph over us. That is for sure. Continuing through our Psalm, verse eight, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. We notice something very intriguing. It reminds us of things that we read in scripture often, things that Jesus said, such as, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And if you go to a banquet, sit in a low seat so that the host may bring you up and exalt you to a higher seat, as opposed to going to a high seat and being humiliated or humbled and told to go down to some lower position. He who humbles himself will be exalted, and he who exalts himself will be humbled. Jesus teaches us to put others first. And notice here, the Lord is good and upright, and he's going to instruct sinners in his way, his path. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble his way. And this way, these paths, are steadfast love and faithfulness. And notice, these things are for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Real biblical faith involves obedience. Waiting upon the Lord is waiting his way, not our way, to humble ourselves before him. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. 
his soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. Again, the Lord will instruct, the Lord will teach, the Lord will lead those who fear him, those who are waiting upon him, those who trust in him, those who humble themselves before him. There's no place in God's way for arrogance or pride. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. If we are looking to the Lord, if we fear the Lord, if we are allowing him to teach us his covenant, he will save us from the net. He will take us out of the snares. In New Testament language, he will unshackle us from the burden of sin. We will be truly free. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. As things shift in the new covenant to a more spiritual outlook, and that's not really quite fair to say, because as we read in last week's class, part of the problem with those following the old law is that they were following it as a way of salvation of works as opposed to faith. They weren't viewing it the right way. Jesus made it more clear, and so that's really what I'm getting at. So our main affliction, our main trouble, our main distress, the main trouble is sin. And the psalmist here in verse 18, forgive all my sins. There's an acknowledgement that that's the big problem. That is the real issue for a human being. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. In two weeks and three weeks, we'll be looking at this idea of refuge. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. We are to wait upon the Lord. We are to put our trust in him. We are to be patient for him. He is the one in whom we put this trust and our hope and our waiting. We wait upon the Lord. And then finally, there's one more verse in this psalm. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. I like that. Let me not be put to shame. All right, so let's move to Isaiah, obviously one of the prophets. Just two verses from here. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations. Those are the non-Jews, the Gentiles. And raise my signal to the peoples. Again, the non-Jews. And they shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. A, a prophecy of the coming together of all people, Jews and Gentiles, all part of the Lord's church, all part of the family of God. The dividing wall of hostility brought down. Verse 23, kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. We need to be people who are praying for and eagerly waiting for the coming of the Lord. In the Old Testament context, it was the coming of the Messiah. They were waiting upon the Lord for salvation, for deliverance. And now that Christ's first coming has happened, 
and he has provided sacrifice for sins, now we wait for the fullness of that. We wait for the completion of that when he comes back again and takes us to heaven. What a glorious day that will be. All right, let's move to another psalm, Psalm 27. So we're not moving too far, just a couple psalms uh, later from Psalm 25, which we looked at. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 14, which is the entire psalm. So a theme of light, a theme of deliverance here, a theme of refuge here. A lot of our themes for this five-week section coming together in this psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? In other words, there it's impossible to fear anyone when the Lord is on your side, when he is your light and he is your salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And so the parallel here is light and salvation parallel with stronghold of my life. Two, all of those being concepts of the Lord's presence and his strength to save. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. As important as this was for those under the old covenant, for those that were alive before Christ, how much more important is it for those of us who live, live as Christians? who live after the fact, who know what has happened and the victory that has already taken place. We can never allow this world to get the best of us. We have the Lord on our side. One thing I have asked for the Lord, of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What an amazing prayer. What a wonderful thing for us to seek. We actually are the temple of the living God at this point, but that will come to fullness as well when we are in heaven. And we will be able to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his presence, in his dwelling place, we will be part of that eternity. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He'll conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. We can take refuge in the Lord. We can trust in him. We are waiting upon him. We hope in him. He will protect us. The Lord will take care of us. We do not need to fear is what this psalm is getting at. When we are allowing ourselves, when we are giving ourselves to the Lord. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. When we realize the Lord's protection, when we realize that we can trust in him, that we are waiting upon him, that we are hoping in him, when we realize his protection and his love for us, one of the natural responses is worship, sacrifices, joy, singing, all of these things coming together. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. 
My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Very important here for us to understand the uh, the Old Testament, not just the Old Testament, even modern day meaning of this. We We have an expression, if someone turns their back on someone, they have not been loyal. They have um, uh, shirked their responsibility. They have abandoned someone. Well, the same was true with this idea. If the Lord's face is towards someone, they are receiving blessings. The Lord is on their side. He is, he is protecting them. He's doing all the things that we're talking about in this psalm. And so the, the psalmist here in verse 9, at the beginning of verse 9, says, Hide not your face from me. In other words, don't turn your back on me, is how we would say it today. But it's the same exact con con uh, concept. Either the person on your side is, is on your side and looking and facing you, or they have turned their back on you. And so, the Lord has said, seek my face. And our hearts should say right back to him, your face, O Lord, do I seek. I am turning myself toward you. I am allowing you to be my leader, my master, my king, my God. We continue with that concept of hide not your face from me. Continuing in verse 9, turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. I think it's a very appropriate thing for us to, when we pray to God, to ask him to hear us, to humbly come before him. We've been promised that he will. We've been promised, and he has asked us to seek him and ask things of him. But it is appropriate because he is God for us to continue to acknowledge who he is by asking him humbly submitting ourselves to him. These are appropriate prayers. Oh God, please do not turn me away in anger. Cast me not off, forsake me not. We've sinned. Now we've been washed clean by the blood of Christ and the psalmist knew that he was one of God's. He says, oh you who have been my help, oh God of my salvation. But still appropriate for us to say, God, please hear us, and please don't deny us, even at the same point that we know that he will not do those things. Verse 10, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. So some more petitions and then acknowledgments of who the Lord is as we close the song. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. A look to the future, a look to eternity. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So we get a little more insight here into this waiting. It's being strong. It's having courage. Again, it is waiting. And the key concept is who we're waiting for. It's the Lord. It's the one with all the strength, all the truth, all the protection, all the love. That is who we're putting our trust in. That's who we are waiting for. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. All right, the next section of Scripture we will look at we're going to look at one more Old Testament passage and then two New Testament passages. The first one, Lamentations, and you can see the word lament right in the name of this book. These are Jeremiah's Lamentations Concerning Jerusalem, five of the most gut-wrenching 
chapters make up this book that we have in all of scripture. But right in the middle of all these laments, we have some hope right here in the middle. Um, so Lamentations 3, verses uh, 19 to 27. These are arranged in uh, three verse sections. This is actually an acrostic. And I um, didn't look at which Hebrew letter all three of these verses begin with, but they all begin with the same letter. And then the next three all begin with the same letter. And the, the final three, 25, 26, 27, begin with the same letter. So a, a work of art, as many of these Psalms are, um, just ab absolutely intricately put together. Really, really cool stuff. But um, uh, for us, we're looking at the idea, the concept of waiting upon the Lord. So let's check this out with that in mind, as opposed to the uh, poetic structure. So beginning in 19, remember my affliction and my wonderings, the wormwood and the gall, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. So all this negative talk, all this, all of these laments, these lamentations, verse 21, but this I call to mind and therefore, I have hope. So a little preview of next week, maybe, uh, the idea of hoping in the Lord. Um, and here we go. Here's why he can, this is what he is calling to mind and why he has hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. All right, so just a few little insights here. Those who wait for him is parallel with the soul who seeks him. So part of our waiting is seeking the Lord. And that makes sense because that's what trusting in him, relying on him, having faith in him, that's part of what that's all about. And then just the statement that it's good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We aren't supposed to be frantic people in Christ. We are to be people of peace people who are the opposite of chaos and the opposite of wildness and franticness. We wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We can be people of self-control, people of peace, people who appear spiritual and faithful. And again, we're not about outward appearance, but if the inside is peace, it will come through as we live our daily lives. Well, we sing another song that's from these verses, and I will uh, share it with you briefly. It's a very short song. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And it repeats, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And then the song repeats, therefore, I will hope in him. Because of the Lord, we have hope. And again, a little bit of a preview for next week's lesson on hoping in the Lord. All right, let's move to the New Testament. We're going to look at a couple passages here, and then we'll close out our class today. Luke 2, 22 to 40. This is a little lengthy passage, but the, the verses aren't super long, and this, this will be good for us. This is Jesus. He's still an infant and he's being brought into the temple. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb 
shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what it is what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. In other words, waiting for the coming of the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. He was waiting for the Lord to do what he had promised to do. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. What an amazing promise for one to receive. You are going to see the anointed one. You are going to see the Messiah. Verse 27, and he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. What an amazing statement. And of course, he's full of the Spirit. He is speaking truth, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. These things were just thought to be unheard of. Despite all the prophecies in the Old Testament, the Jews in Jesus' day, and especially right after, so many struggled with this idea of the Gentiles being able to be saved, to be able to embrace this Messiah, this Christ. But notice not just a light for revelation of the Gentiles, but glory to your people Israel the Jews and Gentiles coming together. This is a theme throughout the whole Bible. So very important. But let's not forget where we are here. Simeon has the baby in his hands, and he's blessing the Lord, and he says these words. And then his father and his mother marveled. This is Joseph and Mary, of course, marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed, sorry, for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Oh, what a... What an amazing thing. All right, but we're not done <laughs> with people being able to see the Christ as an infant. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him, Christ, to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. There were many waiting, many waiting upon the Lord, many waiting for the deliverance, for the salvation that was going to come in and through the anointed one, the Messiah, in the Greek, the Christ. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. Amazing what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, right from the beginning and through his life here on earth 
through his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and now in his dwelling in his people as the head of the church, we his body, he the vine, we the branches, he the cornerstone, we the building. All right, and then our final passage for today, Romans 8, 18 to 25. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So our first statement of waiting is personification. It's the creation waiting. It's the trees and the animals, the, the whole world, physical world, um, waiting with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. In other words, in a personified way, obviously the trees do not, they're not really thinking to themselves, I can't wait for Jesus to come, but the creation is waiting. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So this has been going on since the Garden of Eden. The groaning, the waiting, the longing for redemption, being set free, from bondage to corruption and sharing in the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Pretty amazing stuff. But we find out that not only has the creation been waiting eagerly, but we ought to be as well. And in fact, Paul words it such that we better be waiting. In fact, he says we are. This is a part of being a Christian. And not only the not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And let's pause here a moment because one might ask, I thought we were adopted as sons. Paul has written about this. And the answer is yes. We are adopted into the family when we come to Jesus Christ. But as with so many concepts in the New Testament, there's a sense in which it happens when we are saved, and then there's even a greater sense of completion when Christ comes back again. And that's what he's talking about here, when Christ comes back again, when all this is made complete, when our bodies are redeemed. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. All right, so verses 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? It's not labeled hope when we're looking at it. Hope is something that is coming. It's something we have assurance of that hasn't happened yet. Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, if we do have assurance, if we are doing this, we wait for it with patience. So we've seen a lot tonight of the trust, the trusting, the waiting, and the hoping intertwined together. And these are together. These go hand in hand, hence us doing them three weeks in a row. And so next week, we will look at the idea of hoping in the Lord. Uh, the main two passages will be Psalm 69, 6 and Romans 5, 3 through 5. But of course, we will be looking at several other passages as we hone in on this concept, hoping in the Lord. And may the Lord continue to bless us and keep us in his care as we study his word.